for having me. This has been a very exciting ride. Um, I've been a veterinary dental technician for 20 years plus, uh, qualified by examination in like 96 with the ASVDT. Things have changed a little bit since then to be a dental technician, but my years with boarded dentists and such, and um, now with a practice like Florida Wild has kind of changed the way that I look at things. Um, I um, have a vet tooth tech, as Jonathan uh, had mentioned, vettoothtech.com. It's also my email, vettoothtech uh, at gmail.com. For further questions at on Ozone or basic dentistry stuff after this, you're more than welcome to reach out. Um, I guess we will roll right into the, pre the presentation, I suppose. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try this screen share again, and hopefully if all goes well. There we go. So um, for those of you who are already on the ozone bus with us, um, I will uh, zip through some of these first slides pretty quickly, um, mainly because um, I want to just share my experiences with it. I've been at Florida Wild here for about four years now, and ozone's been here the whole time, and it was kind of bubbling there literally over my shoulder um, without really the recognition of what the heck it was and really understanding it. And Around Florida Wild, we do things very differently. There's a very holistic approach to a lot of things. They're acupuncturists, they're you know, herbalists. They do so many things that kind of bend the curve of traditional medicine that I am used to, especially coming from a boarded veterinary dental clinic, which is kind of blinders on. We read from a textbook and we do everything what everybody else is doing, which is not bad in most cases, but um, it, there's more to it that I've learned. And, and the years here have really taught me so much. So. The first couple of slides I'd like to just share. Um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to just pop through. There we go. Um, the first couple of slides, basically, this is my, my understanding of ozone was the ozone layer and that is the basic of it. That's all I understood. But then I started to understand that this happens around us everywhere, more so than I ever, ever could imagine through lightning, through waterfalls, um, ocean crashes. This ozone is everywhere uh, to the point where um, we can now harness it. That's Jonathan's company where O3 Vets comes, comes in place. Um, the splitting of those molecules. I just I love this slide, to be honest with you, and I had to share it. <laughs> um, and as far back as the 1800s that I learned that Tesla was doing this stuff, and people thought he was a weirdo. He was doing all these crazy doohickeys and gadgets to treat uh, uh, bodily harm and uh, rejuvenation of skins and cells and all kind of things that we, you know, couldn't even imagine. And back then, just to read Tesla ozonized olive oil just threw me through a laughing fit at my desk. And my wife was like, what the heck are you laughing at? I just thought it was the neatest damn thing that we're doing that now. And it's something so important now that was kind of overlooked. Um, so one of the things that I learned and one of the things I like about this slide is when I was a kid, we had the Ozium spray that kills um, uh, uh, through ozone, um, it kills bacteria in the air and kills smells. And that's kind of where I started putting the connection together and how it works, um, at least for me personally. Um, so I like this as well, too. So our traditional bacteria love to hang out and by that ozone beating up that cell and really taking the core of that colony away so it can't regrow is everything for us. You know, we use, you know, pocket treatments. We're fighting biofilm every single day. And one of the things that I tell my clients all the time is that you lick your lips, you lick your teeth after half a day of work and donuts and coffee. We feel sediment on our teeth. That fuzzy slippers is bacteria. That is gross. It's living on our teeth. So we can break it down all we want, but that colony, that, that, the cell wall itself that protects that inner bacteria, if we don't break it down, it's going to continue on to live. So that's where ozone comes into place and we are happy. Um, the other cool thing that I realized too over this journey is that it's used everywhere in water uh, uh, treatment plants, not everywhere, in a lot of water treatment plants and, and big industry for their bottles and such. So that started another connection for me that if it's safe for us to, to sterilize bottles and things and surgical instruments and stuff, it's also safe to kill bacteria topically in, in a lot of other places, which, hello, that's exactly where we're at with uh, dentistry. 
And with some of these things that we also know and what I'm learning and blowing my mind with and why I'm getting so excited is that it's not just killing bacteria, it's cell rejuvenation and turnover time, it's, it's healing faster, it's pain relief, it's so many things that all lead back to dentistry. One of the things that we fight so much, we're really good at doing dentistry here at Florida Wild, but we fight inflammation, we fight pain relief, we fight all those things and we wanted to be good at it. So to add another tool to that, that goes along with our holistic mode of thinking, obviously to us is the answer. Um, um, there's so many things here on this list, for instance, um, are just the, the tips of the iceberg. And I will, at the end of this, um, I'll try to share the PDF, um, that I got some of this information from. And there's also a lot of the last couple of pages will just be links and of some of these studies that I got lost in, um, because I'm not only, um, a dental technician, but I've been working in the field long enough that I do um, equipment uh, maintenance. I help and go set up dental centers for people. And one of the, some of those things that come in line is that they have this old unit that they've been using for 10 years that just riddled with biofilm and gross water that's been bubbled through it for ages. So treating those pieces of equipment with ozone water is a thing and we can maintain things through that too. So um, we'll talk about a couple of these uses that I'm mostly fond of and where it, um, applies to us every single day. And this is not just for the dental nerds like Kevin, this is for um, the general practitioners because what we're doing out there every day is fighting bacteria. So our job as the technician to clean is not only to make it look pretty, which is unfortunately some of the focuses of some people out there. It's, it's, it's about managing the bacteria, not only on the surface, but in the pockets, under the gum line. And let's face it, we don't brush our teeth, our dog's teeth every single day like we should, we should. Um, so ozone is another tool, not only for prevention, but gives us a better chance in telling that owner we're helping them manage this, this process easier. Um, this is my, uh, my little setup, and, and it's very makeshift right now. Please don't judge me. Uh, we moved into a new dental center about a year, almost a year ago. God, COVID has really flipped me for a loop. Um, about a year ago, about five months ago, excuse me. Um, it's gone quite, quite fast, but um, I kind of pulled, I was running to the other building to use our bigger machine. Um, and I realized that we had an ozone um, little hummingbird in storage from O3Vets that I was tired of running back and forth. So I set this up so I have it um, right at my chair side. So um, we talked and I heard at the last um, discussion uh, last Wednesday that I'm sorry I wasn't at, that we discussed using um, this um, and can we put it through our equipment, et cetera. And yeah, we can definitely hook it up to, to, put ozonated water through our equipment, but um, I think it's much easier just to have it readily available. And what we're using, um, we're using it at the one eighth setting on our little regulator. Um, we sometimes will use our little glass syringes here. And then um, what I've learned um, is the rest of the office for general med stuff, especially for when we're going into the body and crossing that barrier that they're using saline for most everything. The half-life in saline is pretty short. Um, what we're learning is the half-life in distilled water is a heck of a lot longer. And then we can increase that length a hell of a lot more um, by chilling it. Um, so often I will take and keep our little beaker there in the refrigerator overnight. Um, I let it bubble or and I'll bubble it as soon as we start our patient's uh, assessment. And then we're able to have um, ozonated saline or ozonated distilled water, excuse me, at the ready throughout the procedure, whatever it may be. And then the hummingbird also is available for direct gas when we do need that. Um, there we go. Um, we just take our bubbler um, with their little uh, filter guy on the bottom. And that's my setup on the desktop. I'm gonna to try to get it a little closer and a little easier for drawing it out. Um, but then we also will use our traditional ozone syringes for those of you probably are using more of these. Um, they, um, I will fill up maybe two of these and cap one um, for direct gas application. I also use a heck of a lot of, actually, you know what I'll do is, you guys can still see my face down there, right? Oh yeah. I don't know if we can hear you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Sorry. Um, so I also will use these little cannulas. Um, they're pretty a dime a dozen. Um, a lot of like restorative materials will come with them. 
um, for, for one use uh, applications, I sometimes will use those, but a lot of times we'll use our uh, normal stainless steel cannulas like you see there. Um, that uh, uh, makes it a little easier for direct application for sure. Um, the little cannulas definitely make it a little, a lot easier. So um, some of the fascinating areas that really, really got me, especially for years of being in a boarded office, is we did a lot of endodontics. And um, in the human side, they're actually injecting gases down into the parts where the abscesses are and are trying to heal the tooth from the inside. And um, me and Jonathan kind of discussed this a little bit before we started. And I think the difference or the disconnect there is that we often get a tooth that's so far gone that we're past the point of saving it. However, um, when we are saving it and we are doing root canal therapies, um, what we have there on the picture is a nice necro necros pulp um, that we would remove all of which to uh, then replace. Um, oh. And what we do is pass those cannulas down. And the old traditional method, believe it or not, um, is direct bleach. They would inject bleach down into those uh, canals to flush out all the bacteria. And when you think about that, the first time that I watched it, I was horrified. I couldn't believe that we were putting bleach into this patient in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but now they're starting to use this in flushing out these canals to make sure that they are completely free of bacteria, 99.9%, .9%, um, before they start to fill that tooth. And that's kind of everything when it comes to endodontics and our canine patients. And that's why very few uh, general practitioners get into endodontics or, or um most uh, boarded dentists sometimes will will curse them as well. Um, here is a little video that hopefully flows nicely. Um, this was a, a pup that we got in here a couple of weeks ago, um, broke the tooth off the day before. So in veterinary dentistry, if we catch a fresh fracture like that within a certain amount of time, usually between 48 hours, um, we can do the medical version of a root canal, which is called a vital pulpotomy. And by us treating the necrosis pulp or the infected pulp um, by backing it up a little bit from the top of the crown, um, we can then treat it with um, medications to heal the pulp. But now one of the things that we are putting in that place is some ozone uh, distilled water down in that area. Oops, let me kill the sound. There we go. Um, in um, some of the studies um, have said uh, in 30 seconds, we kill 99% of the bacteria or 60 seconds, 99% and 30 seconds, um, something like 75%. Um, so we usually will flush this once or twice during that process. Um, and even in controlling bleeding, they're saying up to 20 seconds. So most cases, um, I think every case gets a, a saline flush. It's actually now um, part of our dental package has a dental saline O3 flush on there. Um, one of the things also that I read just recently um, going along with that is one of the things we reach for mostly um, is chlorhexidine um, in our products and in, in our CET. I love Verbac and CET. They've been around since I was like 16 and they were on the shelves at Dr. Bellows' office then. Um, peer reviewed studies behind chlorhexidine that we know that it works and we know that um, it's approved in the moderation that, it, that it's labeled for to help break down bacteria or its, its process. Um, so in some of the studies that I'll share with you at the end here, um, are proving that the chlorhexidine, I mean, or excuse me, ozone um, in distilled water and saline were more effective in most cases than the chlorhexidine was, which is just baffling to me. Um, we also, at Florida Wild, we do a lot of restoratives. Um, we get um, not so many crowns, but we do a lot of bonding and a lot of, of, of bonding and sealing um, with dentin exposures. And like humans, if anybody in the crowd um, has ever had that painful tooth, um, when you have a little ice cream, you get the little ice cream headache. Um, that pain is your nerves inside your crown or, or root that's being exposed to open air. Now, those dentinal tubules that they talk about, once the enamel is gone, it's very porous like a sponge under there, very nerve rich. And to us, it hurts like hell. To them, um, studies have shown up to three times from what I've understood, um, more nerve endings or what are they called odontoblasts in those areas. So they can hurt a hell of a lot more than we can. So a little bit of sealing um, with a little bit of sealant or bonding, depending on how far it is, um, sometimes we can get away with just a little adhesive. And nowadays we use something called ginger shield, which is also pretty helpful. Um, but one of the biggest things is when we put a crown on a tooth, 
um, or we put bonding on a tooth. And I'm sure there's someone out there, and I'm sorry to gross you out with a human picture, but someone out there has experienced this or has somebody who has experienced this. Um, and basically what happened here is they had a tooth that was affected. They tried to bond it. They tried to restore it. They put a crown on it. What they did is they built a nice porcelain fancy house for the bacteria to live underneath um, and put a nice roof under it for it to have a family and do all kind of fun stuff there. Um, so it decays away. So cavities slash caries is decay. So one of the biggest things that we need to do is stop the bacteria from living there. Um, so we take lots of precautions when we do restorative work. So we use an acid etchant. We use chlorhexidine rinses. We use all those things. Now, um, some of the studies that are being provided and some of those references that I talked about um, say we'll get three to four more, uh, three to four times the bonding strength of any other uh, preparation method because we're killing 99% of the bacteria living on the surface before we put the nice fancy roof on top. So to us, we don't get to see our patients as often as a human dentist does. And, and then this is kind of baffling because we're going through endodontics, we're going through restoratives, we're going through periodontics. There's so many things that we can talk about here that you're like, wow, that's a lot of information. But for veterinary dentistry, we have to be the endodontist. We have to be the periodontist. We have to be the pediatric dentist as well. So everywhere we look in every facet, bacteria is a part of that. So us flushing out these guys um, and even... Oh, how did I get that far? So, wow. Kevin, real quick question. Sure. So, on this type of thing, yeah. let's say, um, are you ever injecting ozone into the gum linings down deep or something instead of just flushing? Or is that a recommended or what are your thoughts? Um, both. Um, depending on um, now, just the pocket like what we're seeing here, depending on how accessible that it is. If we can access the pocket and it's it's two, three, four, five, six millimeters where we can hand instruments, use our fancy um, uh, scalers and put the right tips on them and tune them down so we don't hurt the tooth, we can clean it out first and then flush with ozone for quite a bit of time. Because um, not only are we killing the bacteria, but we actually, some of the studies say that the cell and tissue turnover time is increased quite a bit. Um, and one of the things that I saw in the recent talk that you guys had last Wednesday that was very appealing to me, and it's a battle that I'm going through in my brain, as Doc was talking about, I forget her name, I'm so sorry about that. Um, um, she was talking about uh, having people come in for biofilm rinses, and what they're saying is postoperatively, especially when we're managing major periodontal cases, day one and day two are very critical, and they say that the ozone helps most in those two days. So in humans, they kind of fill your mouth up, let you hold the gas in there until you have to blow it out and you blow it out. Um, with them, we can't do that. So we're kind of stuck to having them under anesthesia to administer. So most of the time, a, a H2O or a saline flush is going to be the way to go um, with management of pockets. But if your dog's going to let you do that daily, heck yeah, do it. And we're going to get good results, I do believe. So, um, But the gas now, that's a little bit different story. If we're infected in bone and we feel like we're trying to um, put back a heck of a lot of, like we were talking about before, human medicine um, trying to save a tooth rather than pulling a tooth. And obviously, if we can save it, we will. But I think that's where one a part of my mission is to try to help get more people involved to get more studies involved in the, the who let's do that. <laughs> you know, that's what I'd like to do. Hmm. Let me, um, and, yeah. And as you do that, um, so one of the comments last in our forum last time that, uh, Dr. Roman brought up, um, is how she thinks, you know, cleaning the, running water through the cavitron that's ozonated cleans the biofilm out of the cal cavitron lines and all of that stuff so you seem to so you're using it separate you're drawing up ozone fluid out of the you know the the bubbler and utilizing it that way but uh what do you think about running it through the machine so it's cleaning the machine as well is that um, I think it's actually a great idea, um, but there's a couple of downsides to that because we, like we, you guys discussed last week, um, we don't exactly know all of the plastics and silicones involved right. in the pound time. What I have read in human medicine, they change their water lines on all of their equipment once yearly, no matter what. 
um, even the ones that are doing ozone because they're breaking those lines down with the ozone they may be. Um, however, in my personal situation, I use a nitrogen, compressed nitrogen base um, for my delivery system and my to run my scalers and stuff. Everything is off the nitrogen. So if I put ozone through that, I'll create another gas, which is kind of harmful. So we don't want to do that. Um, personally, you know, running it through your machine is very easy. 90% of the machines out there have a little bottle that you can unscrew and replace with an ozone safe bottle and run the line through your three-way syringe, run it through your high-speed, uh, low-speed drill, run it through your scaler, and run that bottle through each and every one of those hand pieces. Um, if you've ever seen a clear line, if you've ever been to a, a restaurant or bar and you got to see the back of the soda machine and what those lines look like, there's snot in there. It's gross. And the same thing can happen in our situations. And then we're trying to clean bacteria away. We're making aerosol. That's another thing that she talked about before. I mean, COVID right now has made us do this anyways. We're, we're like this 90, 99% of the time of our day. Um, but I think that that aerosol, that's one of the first thing that was driven into my head. And when I go in and consult places and I see that one technician scaling while standing up, bending over with no light and no mask, I usually sit them down and put them a mask on them. And I give them the Kevin talking to because of that aerosol bacteria. So I feel that um, during the procedure, it would be nice to try to break that down. But I think that if you have the proper setup and if you do have the means of plumbing it through without an issue, which it shouldn't be that hard to do what I'm learning. Um, it wouldn't be a bad idea, but then take yeah. in mind, you will be changing water lines probably sooner than you anticipate. Okay. Okay. Um, this here is a little guy that came in not too long ago. And I'm going to want to point out a few things here um, real quick. He, if you look at the flat topping here of these incisors, um, that is our typical and very classic uh, dentin exposure um, that we see uh, in a lot of patients, especially uh, those ball players, especially the tenacious carriers that we see all the time. I believe I have one more here, especially on this upper side, we can start to make out, why can't I get the picture in the right way? Oh, bummer, I can't draw on this one. Okay, I'll clear that. Okay. Um, if you look at the concentric rings of where the enamel starts and stops, we can see that soft uh, dentin beneath. So that's that nerve-rich place that I was talking about before. And yeah, we sealed this dog. We put uh, dentin sealant on him. Um, but a month or two post, the owner was talking about how you know, brushing has really kind of gone downhill the last couple of weeks and uh, she's wincing away from the toothbrush quite a bit. Um, so, you know, I had just read studies on um, desensitizing teeth by using ozone and I, let's see if I can jump out. Oh, sorry. There it is. Let's do, um, so what they do in humans is they will, apply a little cup directly over the tooth and deliver ozone gas uh, for 30 to 60 seconds. And what they're saying, what's happening there is it's opening the dental tubules, it's causing occlusion in there, um, and it desensitizes the nerve endings that are there. Um, so just by putting gas on your tooth that has a caries lesion, not only can we kill the bacteria and let them bond it to the point where we know it's not gonna die, die off later, um, but we're also desensitizing those nerves quite a bit to the point where it's it almost instantaneous in some of the reports that I've read. Um, so I've been so blown away by that that I wanted proof ourselves. So we talked to the owner about it, um, and I know that this is not necessarily an oral thing, um, the, the olive oil, but she used it very moderately on the tip of her finger for home application um, on the, those little front incisors every day. I talked to her a week later and she said that sensitivity has gone down tenfold to the point where she can brush normally without wincing away. And the only thing that we introduced was ozonated olive oil. Um, mm. So to me, um, that was pretty, and she's a, a definitely a client that will tell you if something is not working properly. 
Um, and she was uh, uh, definitely a cheerleader for it and um, wanted to know if she can use it on everybody. And I said, let's, you know, only when where it's needed, uh, let's, let's take it baby steps. But um, so far it's been um, working tremendously. So we're, we're going to open up the avenues on treating sensitivities with it as well. Huh. So a question from the, the crowd here, what, what concentration is used for the ozone gas for the teeth? Do you know? Um, on the hummingbird, um, we don't get a 40. Some of the stuff I've read is about 45 uh, mLs. Um, so what I've been using in that is the, the, it's the 50 setting, I think. Um, I bubble that through the saline I'd, or the, the H2O probably for about some days a little longer because we, oh, crap, it's still bubbling. Um, and we, it's, it's, you'll see that the water definitely holds the, um, the ozone, ozone essence in there quite a bit. Um, and then for the gas, I use the same setting and actually some of the, it's very vague on some of these studies, what they're doing in humans. And I think that they really baby step around some of the dosages, um, because of the human interaction with the gas that can be inhaled. Um, so I think that, um, I'm sticking to the conservative range at this point and I'm getting great results so far. So I think we're going to head on with that. Yeah, so the, about the 45 to 50 mi micrograms per milliliter would be the concentration on that, it sounds like, that, that you're utilizing. Um, is there – so I haven't seen them use – you had a, a slide from – it looks like a German slide um, that had a silicone cup, you know, that was over the tooth. I have never seen those in use. I've always wondered um, – I had a catalog today that I had picked up and because I had a, some of the wants things that some of the things that I want to discuss with you about getting, yeah. um, for our usage. But right. um, I think that that would um, some of those guys have actual um, uh, evacuators built in. So they're kind of uh, killing the exhaust gas while it's delivering right at the handpiece itself. So probably. Um, so you have a vacuum right right there. Well, a lot, and what else? The thing I was going to bring up is that a lot of clinics have had that old CO two laser that they don't use anymore. That came with that stupid big vacuum machine. Um, that is a great use for it um, because you can use and and we're using it to the point where I fill up my syringe and we try to get away and we try to filter the air away from us and out of the room as quickly as we can, so we're not lingering in it. But um, I think at the dosage and at the proximity that we use, it is safe. Yeah. My, yeah, because my concern would be obviously inhaling the the ozone um, to your system, and uh, too much of that's just not good. No, no, it's not. It doesn't smell great either. <laughs> no, no. Um, um, and I think the the last I just have is just a lot of references. Um, I wonder if I could file share here. Add new file. Should be able to choose. No. You know, we would probably uh, you you might be able to upload a file in there um, as we talk here as well um, under under files, or we can just email it out to people. Um, if anybody's interested, I have the PDF um, where a lot of these you'll see these uh, references on um, Carrie's um, toxicology, dental abrasions, caries removal. There's just, it goes on and on and on and on and on. And I can probably talk your head off for days on end when it comes to some of the things that um, they're using it for. And I know the Saudi uh, Journal of, of Human Dentistry is where a lot of this stuff is being um, done at. And there's a plethora of information there for sure. So there was a, there was a question yeah. about I'm using a, a destruct to eliminate the ozone. Um, yeah, the, um, those hand pieces that I was talking about, those wands actually have the destruct built in. So I imagine that if we get a wand that has a almost like an exhaust that has the destruct on the exhaust end, I think we could probably make that very minimal to the usage. But um, yeah, that's how you're just where you're putting it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Dr. Patton, yes, if you use a destruct and the ozone goes through it, you know, you're, there's no problem. It's the issue of actually capturing ozone that has escaped already into the air that we have issue with. If it's a syringe or, you know, right. something that's we can force it through a destruct, that's easy. Um, so anyways, um, another question that just came up, what's your experience treating caries that 
have penetrated into the dentin? Um, well, in veterinary dentistry, uh, caries is oh, sorry, just stop this. Um, caries is not as common as it is in humans. We don't see caries lesions very often, and I think the last it's probably been three to four to five years since I've seen a caries lesion. However, um, it's more going to be um, the little cracks and the little fissures and the, the small resorptions and such that we can see that are treatable. That before we're trying to restore. Um, or cover up, it's it's the ozone usage then to make sure that we've left that area sterilized. So, so one of my big questions is this. So if you're, if you're talking to somebody who, you know, who is brand new to ozone therapy, like this group, and you just want to, you know, you, they have to do a question. We have all this, these other tools, all this other stuff um, for, for veterinary dentistry. Why do we need to add ozone to it? What is the, you know, what is your answer? Uh, well, one of the things that I have recently put a connection to is, for instance, we all treat periodontal pockets or try to quite often. Um, Doxyrobe. When was the last time you could order Doxyrobe through our distributors without back order, without waiting for it, without running out of it? Um, so to me, ozone, o excuse me, ozone water in these pocket sites is going to be more effective probably than this doxyrobe is, especially in the human studies that I've read um, and the availability for us to continue to do it without having to uh, have the cumbersome, uh, cumbersome problems of getting it and for applying it as well. So I think it's a, it's a chair side answer to uh, not using chlorhexidine that can be kind of irritant to, to some tissues to get a multifaceted antibacterial um, a stimulant for healing. I mean, it's just not just for the bacteria, which, I mean, obviously the antimicrobial uh, uh, gener uh, uh, source for ozone is definitely its its uh, main point, but right. all these things uh, obviously are just bonuses, but I think that's our biggest use is that we can have it chair side and do better than anything that we can buy over the counter. Yeah, so... <laughs> When you started working at Florida Wild, it was your first exposure to ozone. Using those two words together probably isn't good exposure in ozone, but it was there. Perfect. That is if you hit the nail on the head. It was more like, what the heck's that smell? Is how I was exposed to it. And they're like, they're using ozone. And they were the first uh, uh, introduction was rectal insufflation of some of these pets. And I'm like, what the hell is going on with these ladies? These guys are weird. So I, I like that's why I was so like enlightened by learning more about it because it was such a what is that? Ew. To I am like I live and breathe and talk ozone all the time now. Now you're a weirdo like us. Um, yeah, I've been converted. Congratulations. So, but uh. But there's there's lots of different uses, and I, I'm wondering. So you're you're obviously focusing on dentistry, which which is what you should be focusing on, obviously. But you know you're working in a clinic where they're using it for a lot of other things as well. So how does dentistry and what you're doing with you know in general, but with ozone in particular, and the way that they're utilizing it in the clinic to help treat chronic illnesses and stuff? How do these things when you talk teeth and you talk health, you know, overall health, how important is it um, to have tooth health? And maybe what role does ozone play in helping us not just fix a tooth or, you know, make sure an infection doesn't start in that pocket or cavity, but in the overall health of the pet in general, long term? I think, again, you hit the nail on the head with the question. Um, with us, I remember one of the first years here, they were sending cancer patients to the dental center. And I'm like, you guys, we do dentistry here. Like, hello. Um, but inflammation is inflammation. And I guess that's the biggest thing that I can put my head, head around. And if, if you're inflamed and you're fighting cancer or you're fighting uh, any inflammatory disease, you know, diabetes, whatever, and the doctors are battling getting regulation on any of these things. And then the mouth is a train wreck. It's full of pus. It's full of just grossness. How can the body focus on healing itself when we have a cesspool of a bacterial factory in the mouth? And that happens all the time. So that was my big realization is when we started getting mouths in shape, 
they're able to start managing other disease processes a little easier and a little better. And we get better responses from the initial or the, the, um, the ever so often treatments of ozone or whatever it may be. We can manage these things a hell of a lot better when they're not suffering here. So it's all connected. Awesome. So I, somebody made the comment, I think, so the name is Jess Hathahu, but I think it's Jessica Hathaway and she works with you, right? So she's trying to be incognito. She's trying to pull the wool over our eyes. <laughs> we know who you are. So she said, though, that you've seen time and again that if we don't address the infections and the inflammation of the mouth, they're unable to make headway a lot of time on those chronic issues. Um, just what you're saying. I think the, um, the, the take home there is that why we're so aggressive in veterinary dentistry about extractions is because the teeth become the source of infection. They become the source of pain and they become the source of inflammation for the pet. So by putting out that fire, we can burn others otherwhere. Another question that was asked, do you use rectal insufflation prior to the dental procedure? Do you think it would help or decrease the need for pain meds post-procedure? I'd love to say 99.9% .9 of the time that we do, um, it's more or less sometimes our day gets away from us and we do forget. Um, uh, however, it is part of our everyday practice that they get rectal, rectal insufflation on their way up to. Okay. Okay. And so there has been some information about ozone helping with pain and, and how it does that. Is there, I mean, just practically honestly in your experience, is there anything to that with what you've seen? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in reports that, well, obviously the stuff that I'm reading, um, some studies have actually proved that in humans. Um, but I really think that's why I shared that last case is that that really hit it forward for me and, and why that I'm even thinking that we even did a little stint in, in putting a, um, an herbal non-steroidal in acupoints that I think that we're going to, we might want to change that up with putting some ozonated saline in those places for pain, just the same, because again, listening to what you guys talked about in our last forum about um, that dog that was walking again after the first treatment was, you know, you can't deny results like that. So to me, the connection with, with pain, with inflammation and those receptors, I think that it's a, um, in my experiences, I'm starting to see it. Um, have I documented enough to share some great cases with you? Unfortunately not, but I think we are, are now on the tracks and headed towards that destination for sure. So in, in veterinary dentistry, if somebody was going to, was going to use ozone, how do they use it? Just one, just one most important way, if you're going to use it. Uh, irrigation and, and fighting periodontal pockets. I think it's, um, in the, the studies are being more effective than chlorhexidine that I've read. Um, and then just, it's readily available. We have to mix chlorhex. We have to just, just dilute it down and the, practices of us getting this ready every day and having it literally sitting there over my shoulder to grab and to fill up a syringe or to whatever I need. Um, it's just ease of use too. And, and it's undeniable going to fight bacteria better. Good. Okay. So I'm going to publish another poll here. If you have, a, if you can, which I would assume everybody can click the mouse button, um, answer that uh that question for us um because i know we have a, a, a mix in some of these webinars now again the forum that we put on is is only for veterinarians um in the veterinarian clinic however when we do a webinar um there's there's a mix of people who we have in these webinars so um i'm just interested in kind of seeing uh who we have in tonight in particular <laughs> um so uh in if you guys have have more questions, feel free to, to keep chatting those in um, here. But I am I'm going to actually after this poll, um, I'm going to put up an offer here for you guys. Um, and uh, what I wanted what I want to do let's just take in that poll. So yeah, so. Great, about 66% are in the veterinary profession. Um, but uh, so, so we have, as I, as I mentioned, we have our uh, summit going on, uh, coming up shortly. So right now, um, 
you get 20% off. It says 205 off, but that's a typo. 205 would be nothing, really. I'm, I don't know what that would mean. But uh, you get 20% off with code SUMMIT20, okay? If you go register for the Veterinary Ozone Summit um, within the next two hours, it looks like. Uh, it's 100% refundable if you have to cancel. Um, it's live streamed, so and you'll get the recording if you register. Uh, we aren't going to sell the recording after the fact. We're gonna, you know, we're just gonna keep that for people who have actually attended. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and I think it's gonna be a fantastic time. Where I like the the way we're gonna do this. We're gonna do um, half an hour lectures, um, which speaker is kind of, you know, that's not a lot of time for speakers. So um, sometimes they're not excited about that. But we're gonna keep it a half an hour, and then we're gonna do a fifteen minute Q and A after that, and then we're gonna do fifteen minute breakout rooms where where we're gonna put you in smaller rooms to discuss what was just lectured on and how it applies to your clinic with a small group of other uh, people there. So um, anyways, just just keep uh, register for that. We'd love to see you there. Um, okay, another question here. Um, boy, there's a, there's a few of them. Have you used ozone gas bubbled D2O? And this, uh, I, uh, I think... Yeah, um, yeah. Stomatitis. It's that's um, the only place that um, is kind of weird in the in the stuff that I've read is that it's good for removing bacteria, and I'm sure for management and long term. But it also there's some contraindications for for animals with um, uh, autoimmune disorders. Um, so I don't know exactly where that cutoff is with them. However, stomatitis is them being allergic to the bacteria in their mouth or teeth collecting that bacteria. So I would say that if we have addressed pockets and we've addressed all those sources of inflammation first and then for management and wipe down regularly you know it's it's hard for me to say that removing that bacteria regularly could not help but i've read a few things that said there are a few contraindications but i would say um we have yes i do know that we've had several pretty bad suture reactions um that we've treated with ozone water for two days or ozone saline for two days afterwards and they heal up. We've had a couple of really bad dehiscence and stuff. So those things, you know, for those direct healing things are great. But somatitis is just one of those things that I don't know anything is going to make great headway there, unfortunately. Thank you. So do you, another question, do you use ozone IV, um, administering um, I, IV? They do. Uh, the medical team does definitely do that stuff. Um, it's part of the regular practice quite a bit. And that's why I use the small little hummingbird out here because they have our bigger, better, batter unit inside. Okay, cool. So, so you're, you're, they just keep you in the back and they give you the hummingbird and they say, yeah. Kevin, do your thing. And they most get literally, <laughs> Most literally I have a building like separate from them and they cage me in here like a little animal. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. So, uh, but uh, Jessica Hath Jess Hathahu um, could definitely answer more questions about their usage for the IV stuff, and they 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 do it all the time. Cool, and we have uh, Susan Scott, who mentions she uses that at home with her, you know, her dogs spraying it in their mouth and all that stuff. I think that's another way. So that that was another question I had um, was, um, do you guys ever send fluids home with a pet owner? so that they can continue to rinse the mouth out with it afterwards. We do. Um, we actually will take jars and we'll fill it and we'll send them home and tell the owner to freeze it. Um, so again, here we'll make sure that the water is cold and that way the half-life is a little increased so they can get it home and freeze it and they'll keep it. Um, the other best way that Dr. Holder tells people to do is actually pour that into a nice new ice cube tray. And then that way you can defrost an ice cube daily to use for your rinsing for management for biofilm like that is a good idea. Mm, okay. Yeah. And, and again, guys, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting over COVID myself, but um, so if, if, uh, if you do take or send fluids home with a client, um, best practice is to use an ozone resistant jar um, so that it will not react with the top or with any of the, you know, the container and tell them to keep it cold and keep you know keep it in the refrigerator at least and and we always say you know up to three days um that they can use it now 
it all depends on how how often you're taking it out and using it and putting plastic, you know, or other materials in there, impurities, all that stuff, you know, is mixed in there. But usually, um, if you keep it cold, you can after a few days, you can definitely still smell ozone. You don't oh, know yeah. exactly how much is in there, but yeah. Um, that's why I definitely for, for that go home stuff, um, definitely go with the distilled water rather than saline. The half life is a heck of a lot more. And as long as you're starting with cold water and keeping it cold, you're going to keep it up in those higher ranges for sure. Yeah. So, so that's an interesting point. So I'm, I, I, if, and if you have any information on that, I'd like to see it because the, the, the stuff that I've seen, seen on saline and distilled water are fairly similar as far as the, how long they last. I have seen a study that shows by distilled water lasts a lot longer. Um, uh, but by distilled water is hard to get. Um, I think we fight to get distilled water in the office enough as it is. Yeah. Uh, um, it was one of, um, and I'll have to get you the information of who I read and who I was yeah. talking to at the time. Um, I but it was when I was like, you know, we use saline and it's not long enough for us to send home with our clients. He goes, well, why are you using saline? The half-life is, is this. So mm. he tipped me off to the page. So I'll, I'll have to send that over to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, there was another question in here. If I run ozonated water through this to my scaler, am I going to destroy the hoses in my machine? So we talked about that a little bit earlier. Can I run pure water through to rinse the lines or is it too late? They have a traditional dental matching with, with bottles of that screw in. It falls into the category what you guys were talking about last time is that because we do not know what hoses are used, what type of plastics, what type of silicone is there, we don't know how long it's going to take for them to break down. Um, that's why I will continue to lean towards like once a month, run some ozone through there, flush everything out and clean it out afterwards so that we're not relieving residual. Um, so therefore we're not getting to the point of breakdown of plastics and such. Um, however, I think it has its place for going through those machines because we've all had the high speed drill that doesn't want to blow, you know, uh, water out of the one hole or doesn't want to blow water at all because there's, lots of little pressure valves and check switches and all that kind of crap all the way through there that it's going to take a little bit of that bacterial snot in there to just plug something up and stop it going. So I can't deter you or say that it's not a bad idea to put it through there, but um, I don't think we know enough yet about those things to tell you how long you should be doing it. That's why I'll lean to the air of caution and say, just keep some ozonated water nearby. Yeah. And I, I would say if somebody is going to use it in that way, um, keeping it at a very low concentration would be a good idea. So we're looking at not saturating that fluid with ozone. We're looking at maybe one to three micrograms of ozone into that fluid to get ozone in there and run it through, but it's not going to be at a concentration that's going to break stuff down so quickly or so easily as far as if there's plastics and stuff that are going to, you know, react. Um, let's see. And, and so if you have, let's say, freshly ozonated saline and freshly ozonated distilled water. Um, question was, do you, is there any difference in the results between the two? Is there any reason to expect that one's going to be superior to the other as far as results? Because chemistry is uh, such a yucky place and it's outside the body most of the time, um, we're not really crossing that barrier. So we will lean, at least in dentistry, um, mainly for the availability. Now I don't, um, I can't tell you that the, the adhesion to ozone to the water versus the saline and how much is actually there. Um, I don't have that information for you personally. Um, however, um, I don't think it's much different in as long as it's in the time frame that we're talking about that half life. I would I would agree. I think the literature supports that you can saturate both fra fairly closely um, as far as those fluids. Um, any merit to storing ozonated water upside down in the ref refrigerator. Dr. Broadfoot, you're going to have to <laughs> expound on that. I, I don't, I am not following that. So like the jar upside down. So you put it in the jar upside down into the refrigerator. I've never heard anything on this personally. So I, I can't see, um, regardless of, I guess what, what you mean there, that it would make a difference. Any, you, you have any idea, Kevin, or on that one? No. Uh, Oh, I have never seen or heard anything about the position of a Yeah. Um, 
And Dr. McKee asks, any experience with injection of saline or MAHT in oral tumors? Um, no, we have not ventured down that path. Um, we use our sauna wave more for those guys. Um, we will treat with sauna wave and other facets of ozone like IV, et cetera, um, for the lead up to the actual excision of the tumor. But in our experience with them, we try to get aggressive and get around them and get as much of the material out as quickly as possible. Okay. Okay, so Dr. Broadfoot clarified a little bit. So the ozone stays on top. Um, I, I still don't think so. Um, however, some people have, when they ozonate a fluid, like like Kevin there, or what we recommend is we bubble it through there and the ozone that is not absorbed dissipates, right? It goes out of destruct and is, and is uh, captured and turned back to oxygen. Now, when you put it in a container, the ozone, some of that may release, okay? And, and it'll break down as well, but there may be some ozone on the top, you know, the, uh, above the fluid that is not um, saturated into the fluid itself. So if you wanted to, you could shake it and you might get a little bit more of that ozone that had collected on the top back into the fluid. That's possible, but I don't think whether you store it which one way or the other will make a difference. I think I know where he's getting out with the thought process of that extra that comes from the fluid itself in the, in the negative space of the jar by keeping the, I, I kind of think, I know where he's going, at least with the thought process for sure. Yeah. Um, so, great. Well, we are, uh, we're actually uh, right about nine o'clock now, guys. And uh, you all have been a great crowd. And Kevin, you have been wonderful. Um, <laughs> very helpful. Somebody did say, Definitely keep teaching, um, and I would agree. Um, keep keep doing it, man. And we'll hopefully uh, be doing some more in the future. Who knows? Uh, but guys, don't forget to uh, register for the summit if you haven't yet. Um, and and again, we we uh, we really appreciate you taking your time, Kevin, to come in here and to help teach these people and to teach me uh, more about dentistry and ozone um, and how they could be used together. Um, really. Really appreciate that, guys. This will be up on our YouTube channel um, for those of you who want to send somebody by there to, to watch this or to get some information. Uh, we'll post it on there in the next few days. So um, if you if you want access. Otherwise, any last words, parting shots there, Kevin? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, everybody. I didn't realize we had so many people in the room. That's really awesome. And thank you, John, for having me a part of this. Um, I'm super excited about this. I love dentistry very, very much. So if you haven't uh, been able to notice, uh, feel free to reach out to me, uh, vettoothtech uh, at gmail.com for any questions or anything like that. You're more than welcome. Awesome. Everybody have a great night and we will see you soon. Bye. <laughs>